Welcome to the Gibson Guitar Studios here in London for a very special occasion. Tonight we celebrate the anniversary, the 30th anniversary, of a very special iconic album. That album is Def Leppard's Hysteria. And tonight you're going to be hearing stories from the studio, stories from the road, the triumph, the tragedy and everything else in between from a man who's been there, done it and got several thousand t-shirts, trust me. So what I'd like to do is let you guys here at Gibson Guitar Studios and you guys on Facebook Live uh, to welcome the man himself, Mr. Joe Elliott. He obviously likes to keep the crowd waiting because, you know, that's what's called milking in the trade. <laughs> Should we do it again? Okay. Can we just rewind that bit on Facebook Live, please? So, here we are at Gibson Guitar Studios in London. And we welcome the legend, Mr. Joe Elliott. How are you, Joe? Good to see you, mate. Have a seat. So here we are again, and we have chatted so many times, Joe, in... Oh, it's nice, that, isn't it? It's very nice. You need to grab one of those. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Technology and all that, you know. Evening. Hello, hello, hello. So as you can see, we're here tonight to celebrate 30 years of hysteria, and as you've seen as well, these are just some of the various packages that are going to be available from tomorrow. And you've certainly gone to town, Joe, that's haven't you, on that? That's not one of them. No, that's mine. Yeah, we have. We... Um... We wanted to make a point, you know, it's 30 years. You, you, you spend your life over the last 30 years watching other bands older than us. <laughs> there are some. <laughs> um, Queen, Pink Floyd, you know, Beatles, Zeppelin, putting out these box sets. So you kind of, you, you want to join in, you know, you want to be part of the, the big team, you know, the top division. And 30 years is a great time to put this album out. And so this is the boss collection right here. The other thing as well, and the big thing in recent years is the return of vinyl and heavyweight vinyl too because our age group, most of us here, all remember the original vinyls and going into a shop to buy something you can sometimes not really see, a package like that is still the icing on the cake, isn't it? Well, it's the, this 180 gram vinyl thing is, is how it always should have been but back in 1973, 74, I remember 72 actually um, when most people probably weren't born. But 1972 when Ziggy Stardust came out, they said, oh, we've got this whole new thing, it's called Dynaflex. And it's like, you can bend it in half. And it's like, why the fuck would I want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually just a great way of dressing up the fact there was an oil shortage. So they were using half the amount of vinyl. So they, they put this like rubbery, you know, bendy stuff in instead. So they, they would warp. If they got past like, you know, 70 degrees weather, the records would just warp. So every record I had warped in the summertime because there were all these, you know, these bendy, crappy, rubbish because of the oil shortage. These are the real thing, you know, they would snap before they, you know, you couldn't bend them. It's like a piece of steel, you know. Sheffield steel. Sheffield steel indeed. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said. Anyway, let's talk about the album, 30 years. First of all, I mean, that's hard to believe that it is 30 years because we were chatting backstage before about what happened in 30 years. I mean, where did it go? It's like ridiculous. Well, I've been saying all day, you know, I've been doing press since like, I was on BBC this morning, and uh, they were talking about the same thing. And it, you know, there's, a, there's only one answer to certain questions. But 30 years, if you're wrongfully imprisoned, that's a long time. <laughs> but if, you, if you're doing what we did, and you've, you've, you've had this extremely pleasurable experience of making an album that's been accepted as a, an iconic piece of work, the 30 years is a joy, really, because it's, an, it's enabled us to work as often as we want to, because we've got this album that, let's be honest, since it came out, half of it we've played live every night. So you better like it, because <laughs> careful what you wish for, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. um, we used to call it the Pete Townsend syndrome, where he's written this song called My Generation, and for the next 50 years, he's gonna be playing it. So you better like it, you know? Um, if you can't handle 
the responsibility of writing a hit and then don't write one. And these songs are a pleasure to play live because they're accepted by the audience and they want us to play them live and we have no problem playing them live. So, you know, 30 years, it's like, really, is it 30? Because we were prodded about this about nine months ago, a year ago. It's like, you know, you're coming up to your 30th anniversary and we're like, what? Holy crap, it's that long ago? Yeah. Am I that old? Really? Yeah, <laughs> you are. <laughs> So it's it's flown, you know. It's, I mean, I can't remember much about it, but it's, to it's totally flown. I mentioned during the introduction, triumph and tragedy, those two big T's, and there was a lot of both, let's be fair. I mean, before the album came out 30 years ago, you had three plus years of all kind of goings on. I mean, first of all, you wanted to get in the studio, and the idea was to get in, once again, with Mutt producing, because he'd done such a stunning job on Pyromania. That's correct. Um, we got together in Dublin in like mid-February to start writing this record. It didn't really kick in till March because, to be quite honest, having spent a year on the road taking your clothes out of a suitcase and, you know, forever moving, we were living in this house where we were hanging clothes up in a wardrobe. We'd forgotten what wardrobes were and mattresses that were the same mattress every night. And we were having a ball just l loving the Dublin lifestyle and, and the nightlife and sleeping in the same bed more than two days, you know? And we didn't get any work done. We just got a lot of drinking done. And um, by about March, we started writing, and Muck came over to, you know, as he did do pre-production with us on every record we'd done with him up to that point. And then he said, I, I can't do the album <clears throat> because I'm knackered. I just need a break. He, he, he actually bailed on Heartbreak City by the car. Is it Heart, Heartbeat City? by the cars and let Mike Shipley mix it because he was just exhausted. And he said, I'll, I'll, I'll sit in for the pre-production, but I can't produce the record. So we had to go through this whole process of trying to find somebody to replicate what Mutt did, which is impossible because he's the number one. Everybody is a step down, so what's the best step down? And everybody we tried wasn't interested. So we thought, I mean, Chris Thomas is one guy that we were really interested in. He'd done the you know, he'd worked with the Pretenders and a bunch of people. And uh, <clears throat> I met him about 10 years ago and I said, why did you not want to do Hysteria? Uh, and he went, what, what are you talking about? So we, have, we approached you to produce. And he said, well, I never heard about it. And then he finds out that his manager blew it out on his behalf without even telling him about it. So <clears throat> we, had, we were going through a lot of kind of stuff like that and we ended up with Jim Steinman. Which was a bit of a disaster to well, say the least, um, wasn't it? you know, we, were, we weren't stupid. We were like going, hang on a minute. Bat out of hell, great record, 20 billion sales. It was produced by Todd Rundgren, not Jim Steinman. He wrote it. So why are we entertaining this guy as a producer? Because he'd done a few Bonnie Tyler songs and Sure and stuff like that. But it was like the suggestion by all these grown-ups. And we went, all right. And even Mutt was like, well, give it a go. So we gave it a go, but it was oil and water. It was never, ever going to work. It just wasn't, you know. But when, by the time we got to Holland to start recording this album, we'd got about nine songs written, of which I think five survived, and the rest ended up being shelved and revamped later on for things like Retroactive. Um, but it wasn't going to work, and we tried and tried and tried, and apparently it came up in... Some of the like web conversations today is like the disappointment with this thing if, <laughs> is um, there's no Steinman session stuff. There isn't any because back in 1984, we were, you know, the technology that we had, it was 24 track, two inch analog tape. And if you didn't like something, you just went over it. Like you would wipe EastEnders on your VHS machine. <laughs> Once you've watched it, you'd use the tape again. So we would record over and replace all the stuff that we did with him. We might keep the drums and replace the guitars, and then we would lose the drums. So nothing got saved. That's why there is no Steinman sessions. As far as I'm aware, we didn't make safety copies. We just wiped them because we, were, we weren't proud of them. We didn't like them. It wasn't where we wanted to go with the record. It wasn't just the disastrous sort of recording process with Jim, but it was also his extravagance and his, his extracurricular stuff outside of the studio that was driving you mad as well, wasn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, we're from Yorkshire, you know. Um, <clears throat> when a guy says, I hate my hotel carpet. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I don't want to get 
apparently Jim's not very well at the moment, so I don't want to rag on the guy too much, but you can imagine the five of us like going, what? <laughs> I, I want to change the carpet in my hotel room. I don't like it. Okay, well, then you can do that if you want, but we ain't paying for it. You know, it was, it was stuff like that, and he was working some other meatloaf record, so he was up all night writing his own stuff and then coming to work with us six hours late. And we'd be twiddling our thumbs waiting for this guy to turn up, and he'd walk in like the walking dead, you know. And the, it just, it, it, it was a cash cow for him. I think he saw it as like, we'd done six million records, previous album, this, this is easy money or whatever, I don't know. But we just didn't work well as a team. It just wasn't working. So we, we got rid of him. We got a bunch of backing tracks down, but we just didn't like the way they sounded. It wasn't us. It was like taking us live. And we were trying to create stuff that we'd struggle to replicate live later on, but we wanted to make records like Queen, not like, you know, some bog standard rock band. And so if you took the theory of, you wouldn't write Bohemian Rhapsody if you were just worried about how you're going to play it live, because how the hell do you play it live? We wanted to create music that we'd never made before, and hopefully nobody else had ever heard it in that style before. And he, we weren't going to get that with him. He just wanted to capture us live and make us sound like ACDC or whoever was popular at the time. And that wasn't going to work for us, so we got rid of him after about six weeks. Now, before Mutt came back into the fold, the original plan was to try uh, Nigel Green, who, who worked with Mutt anyway, but that didn't kind of pan out well, either, it, did it? it was fine. Nigel was great. Nigel worked with us all the way through the album. He came in, he still engineered it when Mutt came back. But we were all second-guessing what would Mutt do, you know, which is, like, really difficult because Mutt never has a plan. It's all, like, in here, and he never lets it out. He goes, no, 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 yes. Why is that a yes and those three are no? I don't know. Just is, you know. Okay. The learning curve was pretty, pretty hard, <laughs> but it was fun, you know. I mean, we had, a, we trust me, we played as much football or whatever you guys call it, table football, as we spent in the studio, you know. I mean, it was a long time recording that record, but most of it was on the record, but quite a lot of it was like not on the record. Um, and when we were working with Nigel, we were busting our nuts trying to, and we were making Pyromania too. We absolutely were. It was a good record. You know, some of the stuff that ended up on Retroactive was part of all that session, things like Ring of Fire, uh, Wanna Be Your Hero was originally called Love Bites, and we just took the title and stuck it on the ballad. Um, <clears throat> there was a load of stuff that was, like, okay. But it wasn't like... It wasn't what, say, uh, Day of the Ra Night, Night of the Opera was from the leap it was from Sheer Art Attack, and that's what we wanted to do. We didn't want to make, with the greatest of respect, Don't Look Down, the second Boston album, it's kind of like side three and four of the first record. You know, it's, it's the same record. It's like a double album. And we didn't want to do the same record twice. So we needed a visionary to, we needed a sounding board. And we had all these ideas, but we had no idea how to get them down. Mutt Lang knew, he'd been working, look at the records he'd made before Hysteria. You know, you can start from, for those about to rock and work backwards, and then you go, wow, you know. So he knew what he was doing, and we needed his expertise to siphon through our, mad ideas because we weren't at loggerheads but we're like oh i want to do this i want to do that but we didn't know how to do that we was like we want to turn this inside out and upside down and backwards and stuff and he go, well i can do that so we had to have his and when he came back in we had his vision and his confidence to do that he really believed in what we were doing but we needed a direct you know it's like any football team, when, how can the same 11 players play so badly under one manager and three weeks later when he's been fired and a new guy comes in, the same people up the league, you know? I and mean, it was the same kind of thing. We just needed, we needed a, a director. What's a long process, as we said, I mean, three plus years to record it. And we mentioned the tragedy. When things sort of started going okay in the recording process, then you got New Year's Eve, 1984, that tragic accident with Rick, losing the arm. I mean, I know you were telling me uh, on several occasions in the past about when you heard the news. I mean, it was just absolutely devastating for everybody. And how did you react? I mean, when you, when you got that news, I mean, obviously, it, it's just, wow. How well, that did you was, deal with it? That was before Muck came back in. That was a long time before Muck came back in. So that was right in the middle of all the how could he get any worse times, you know. It was a great lesson in life for us, really. We, you know, we were struggling with the record. Then Rick... We, were take, we took a break at Christmas as everybody went home for the, to do their family thing. And I get the phone call like one o'clock in the afternoon. Peter Mensch, are you sat down? No, 
oh, you better sit down. You know, just so, even just watching movies, yeah. he's not about to tell you who won the lottery. Um, and he said, your drummer's had a car crash. And first thing I thought was he's dead. And he said, he's lost his arm, which was even worse because I knew what death was and I knew how to deal with it. You know, I knew how to, it would be a process, but I knew what it was. I knew people had died, you know. John Lennon, four years previously, and all that kind of stuff, and grandmas and grandpas, and all this shit. But your drummer's lost his arm isn't in the book of rules of how to deal with human nature tragedies and stuff. There is no, there is like your drummer's lost his arm. There is, you know, there is no book on, on, on how you deal with that. So the process of, of actually going through it in your mind, it just takes a little while for it to sink in. And the first thing you think is like, well, that's his career done. That's him down, the, it's done. I mean, there's no such thing as a one-armed drummer, is there? You know, we hadn't heard of one at the time. Apparently there's loads of them, <laughs> but we didn't know at the time. Um, and so you sat there and I got my parents with me. It's New Year's Eve, or it's New Year's Day, whatever. And my dad just stuck a whiskey in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> which didn't last very long. Um, and I'm like, I, I don't know how to deal with this, you know. And so, of course, you, it just settles down and the information is in your head and you, it's going around like a, a whirlwind, really. And, of course, the next thing you do is you jump in a car and leg it up to Sheffield to go see him, but he's kind of in a coma. And he almost lost his other arm, which most people don't know, but he, it was, he was smashed to bits, you know. But he's a very resilient and stubborn person <laughs> which works in his benefit for his benefit most of the time you know and he was not going to let this kill him and he, he, i mean he almost died but he didn't and then he started to recover and then as far as we were concerned he started hallucinating because he says oh i can play the drums again and we're like right though <laughs> <laughs> but what we didn't know is that mutt had been up to see him and mutt had said well you know technically Drummers in the rock band don't use the pedal foot for hire. It's that's a jazz thing. We don't do that. It's, lock it off. You can just bang away on it. You know, so you could use that foot for a snare pedal. And this obviously made Rick think, and he's got a piece of sponge at the bottom of his bed to help him sit up to eat or whatever. And he starts playing drums on the sponge and this kind of thing. And that's when we thought he's hallucinating. He's having hallucinations. And, uh, but anyway, he, um, we said, look, here's a deal. You're our brother. You really are, you know, and we haven't got the balls to kick him out of the band anyway. If you're not in this band anymore, it's your choice. It's up to you. So we went back to Holland sometime like the first week of January, six, seven days after this happened. And we all gathered in, in Whistlord Studios. And, you know, you can imagine the atmosphere was as flat as a, second and pint you, you know and we we're like okay and we haven't got Mutt there either who's like punching in the stomach they go come on we can do this you know and uh, so we're all like kind of uh, and we're sitting around and we're like farting about with this record we've got loads of drums on track so we can do all these overdubs and we finally we start getting things going and it's all and Rick's going to be in hospital for six months so it's like we'll just plow away Anyway, six weeks, he's out. He, ch he checked himself out, bored. And he's also, he's 21, and he's, so he's recovering pretty quick. So he went home to his mom and dad's place. Two weeks, he's bored. Next thing, he's in the control room in Holland. <laughs> Sat there like going, what are you doing? <laughs> that's crap, that's crap. And he's like, he's dictating from the back of the control room what we should be doing. Like, oh, this is good, you know. He never did this before. Um, and then he, we got him Studio 4, which is this tiny little studio, and he put his electronic kit together that Pete Hartley in Sheffield had built for him. Very, it's the one that was in, if anybody saw pictures from Viva Hysteria in Vegas, we had the kit up in, in, in the uh, kind of the, what do you call it, the lobby of the hotel. It was in part of the display. And it's like, you look at it now, it's like Jurassic Park. You know, it's this old rusty piece of shit. But. <laughs> At the time, it was cutting edge, and uh, he's in there with his thing, and he says, I don't want anybody to hear me. I want to make all the mistakes on my own. And he locked himself away for like four months, and we carried on with Nigel making the record, 
and then Mutt got in touch and said, I think I'm okay, I think I'm ready to come back. And we're like, hooray. And then, you know, I can't remember the exact running order of this story, but sometime around this same period, Mutt, um, Rick came out of, of Studio 4 and he said, I want you to come and hear me. And he went in and he put the headphones on and he starts playing When the Levy Breaks by Led Zeppelin. And we were like... <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievable. It really was so emotional. It was just amazing. He's playing it and he's nailing it. He's doing all these fills, you know, like, wow. And then Mutt's back in and we slowly but surely we start piecing this thing back together again. I think his positivity throughout it, the whole experience really is what drove you as a band to finish that album because without that positivity from him, you wouldn't really have got to the point you did with Absolutely Hysteria. not. You know, th there's no shame in it. You know, not every band is self-sufficient. You know, even the Beatles have admitted that without George Martin, they wouldn't have been anywhere. They couldn't even... He, he's the guy that introduced them to all the funky chords and the, the diminished sevenths and the strings and just pushing the envelope a little bit further. And that's what he did. Mutt knew that we were this... When he first saw us, which was opening for ACDC in 1979 in Bingley Hall, Staffordshire, he said to Peter Mensch, he says, unpolished diamond, but polish that, it's going to be huge. And he wasn't available for the first record, but he made himself available for the second one. So he was always wanting to be part of what we were, because he saw there was something there, but it needed guidance. Yeah. You know, it's like anything else. It's like, it's like Kung Fu. The dude needs training, and then he can go off into the desert and kick ass, you know. And, and that's what it was like with Mutt, you know, we, we worked 11 years with Mutt Lang and even after Adrenalize, he went, you guys don't need me. Of course, I mean, we could have used him, but he was, the point was that from a sonic point of view, we'd learned a lot from him. We, but we hadn't, by hysteria, we were still learning and we needed guidance to do this. We had the riffs, we had the melodies, we had the ideas, but he polished it all up and put it in order and gave it some gave it some order that it didn't have. It was a little bit like um, something that snakes around when you're not got it under control. You've got to get it tied down and channel the energy a bit more. And that's what we were. We were kind of like five headless chickens, really. We were full of ideas and enthusiasm, but it was all a bit misguided a lot of the time. And, and that's what happens to a lot of bands. They've got great potential and they fall by the wayside. He made sure we didn't. And, and that was his, one of his big roles. Fast forward to 1986 now, the year before the albums were released, you did that big, in inverted commas, rehearsal gig at the Monsters <laughs> of Rock at Donington. Yeah. And I remember you guys going on stage, and Rick in particular sitting on the drum stool with the uh, rehearsal 86 t-shirt on the back with Donington spelt with two N's, and the, and the dates you got there. And I know you said when you went on stage, you weren't going to make a big deal about it, you were going to go on stage, you were going to play the gig and see what the reaction was like. But the reaction itself, made you do something completely different that day, didn't it? I didn't realise it was Donington with two N's. That's probably some kind of reaction to the fact that most people spell Elliot with one T. Yeah. Fuck yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, though. Even in 1987, Bon Jovi, when they headlined it, it was Donington again across the top of the stage with two N's. How can you do that? Or Bon Jovi with two N's. How can you do that? That would have been yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, when, when we did five warm-up shows in, in Ireland, um, I mean, really nowhere, Limerick, uh, Waterford, Ballybunion, we played a, an ice, like a roller skating rink, and we had to clear out for this disco, and, and we went on stage at, after sound check because we're opening, it's a roller skating rink. And then we went on at midnight, you know, and it was just crazy. Um, but it was so Rick could screw up in front of no people, pretty much, you know. Because we had these Monsters of Rock shows. There was also uh, the German one, and there was one in Sweden. But Donington was the big one, because it's, it's the UK, you know. I mean, we, haven't, we weren't even a big band. We were, oh, they're big in America. Pyromania sold in America, but nobody bought it in England. Well, it started dribbling sales. And I think by 86, we'd done about 150,000, which if we'd have sold them on one day, would have gone to number one. But they sold, like, one copy every 150,000 days or whatever. <laughs> so nobody even knew it was out, you know. Um, and so we're on stage and we've made this point, look, it's not a freak show. He's got one arm, everybody knows. So we just play the show and not make a big deal of it. And you could see people peer, trying to peer through the symbols. 
there's 80,000 people out there. And they're like, they're on our side. You can tell they're on our side, you know. They don't know the material as well as we do, but they're on our side. And we were going down really, really well. And I turned around to Phil and I said, I can't not do this. I have to do it. And he went, yeah, you are. Yeah. Yeah. So I introduced him. And I've said it a million times. It was like a hairdryer. You could actually feel it, never mind hear it. They moved the air like a bass speaker when they cheered his name because he pulled it off. He played magnificently that day, apart from when he started crying all over his kit. But <laughs> <laughs> he was amazing because we were thinking he's going to electrocute himself. You know? <laughs> 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 you know? But he was, no, he was, it was amazing. It really was. You see, the thing about Def Leppard is it's not just a band. We're, we're family. And so these human interactions that we have with ourselves overspill to the audience. Um, and th I think they pick up on the fact that it's, it is truly a band of brothers. I remember years ago when Fast Eddie left Motorhead, there was a letter in sounds and it went, they're not a band anymore because the gang's gone. And I remember thinking, you know, I get how people cling on to the, the legend of the same magnificent five or whatever it is, you know. Obviously with Steve, it's a bit more difficult because he's gone forever. But the thing is that with Rick, they saw more than just like a guy that's a drummer. It's just, he's one of us, he's a, he's a guy. We gave him the chance, or so everybody thinks, but we were, like I said before, scared shitless of saying, <laughs> nah, you're dreaming, son, you know. He made a point of, his willpower was insane. His talent is, to, is without question, but his willpower could have been in question, but it wasn't. And that Donington gig was the start of everything that I think bonded a, a, a relationship with our audience in the UK. Definitely a huge turning point, wasn't it? It was massive. And when we went back to Donington 23 years later, which was, a, you know, again, it's to, hit, to Rick, it's like a, it's a sacred piece of ground to go to Donington with one end. Uh, um, and I did this lot, I didn't even plan that I did this like I think somebody said to me once it was 11 minutes really? that's like longer than Stairway to Heaven <laughs> this speech about Rick and it's like it's 23 years since he's been here and it was the same thing you could hear a pin drop out front you know, I'm, not, I'm not giving my it's nothing to do with me I was just saying it but it was all about him and this it was 23 years since he played there and what have we achieved in that 23 years? And he's still on the drum stool. That was the thing that was like, yes. Absolutely. Now, the album, 30 years ago to this very day, came out. And as we said, it did cement your uh, reputation in the UK, going to number one in the UK and in Europe. But the States was a lot slower catching on, wasn't it? I mean, you were expect, well, hoping that it was going to do as well initially as, Hysteria, as Pyromania, but it didn't initially until Pour Some Sugar On Me was released. Yeah, it was... Um it was a weird situation because everything else that we'd done in, in Europe and the UK was not really that successful. And then we, we released Animal in end of May, early June, like, you know, a couple of months before the album came out. And it started to sound, it's like, oh, ooh, you're on top of the pops next week. Well, yes. I can tell my friends, like, you know that band that I'm in that you don't believe in? <laughs> you don't know it? You think they're a figment of my imagination? We're on top of the pops. Because you also you? did the <laughs> ITV version as well. I remember coming up to yes, the we 90s did. We did in all sorts Newcastle. Of stuff. And you did the Roxy with Kid Jensen, which yeah. was supposedly the, uh, the, the competition did. for ITV, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, we did, we did everything that we could because we wanted... We grew up watching Top of the Pops, so we wanted to be on Top of the Pops. A lot of bands didn't want to do it. Well, we're not doing Top of the Pops. Why? Bowie, Bolan, Mott, Queen, Slade, Sweet, everybody we loved were on Top of the Pops. We're doing Top of the Pops. You know, and the song goes up and he goes top 10. And it's like, wow, this is the highest chart position we've ever had. And then he goes in, I think it peaked at number six or something like that. It's a legitimate hit, you know. It's up there with your, your Radar Loves and your, all these songs that we grew up listening to as kids, Argent and Mott and Sparks and whoever. Um, and of course, then the album comes out and we get the call and it's gone in straight at number one. And we're like, wow, 10 years after we formed, which is longer than the Beatles were together. We had a first hit in the UK. But in America, it took 49 weeks to hit the number one spot. And 
in fairness to it, it was a it was a slow burn. You know, it went in the top ten and it never left the top ten for six months, and then it dropped out, and we all went, uh oh, went down to twelve or something like that, and then the next week it went back in, and then from that moment onwards it just started weaving its way up to the top, and the whole summer of '88 was amazing because it was either us Van Halen or Guns N' Roses, and we were all swapping out. Are you number two this week? Why? Because Guns N' Roses got number one. <laughs> and the next week, we got to number one. And you imagine, like, Axel's going... <laughs> 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 and then it's Van Halen. <laughs> you know? And we, we, had, we, we spent six weeks of number one over about a 12-week period. It was just a fantastic summer of rock. You know, it was... I think there was a couple other albums that might have popped in and out there. Um, but generally speaking, we ruled. Us, GNR, and, and Van Halen. It was a fantastic time, but it took 49 weeks. Slow burn, you know. And the power of the audience as well, because so many people, uh, as the story goes, when they'd heard it in the likes of the big strip joints in the States, they'd heard it, they want to hear Forcing Sugar Me on the radio. It got requested, it got played, it got released as a single, and that really, again, was the catalyst for it to, to go boom. It didn't hurt, <laughs> yeah. Um, we'd, we'd put Sugar out to what they call rock radio, which is more hardcore than Top 40. And he didn't really do anything. Um, so we were just touring and just, okay, well, you know, you do, just, you do what you do. And the song didn't really take at rock radio. But then um, gentlemen's clubs, let's call them. Um, some of the, the, uh, the clientele were requesting the song and the dancers were re requesting the song and they were dancing to it and they were getting paid a lot of money for this song. And they would start asking the radio to play it so it would become more popular. And it was like a forest fire started in Florida and went whoosh, all the way across the States in about eight weeks. And top 40 started playing it who wouldn't touch it six weeks, six months earlier. And all of a sudden it starts going up the charts. And I, th I think it, it, it got to number two, maybe, I don't know. The only number one we ever had was Love Bite. So it, but it, was, it wasn't a fact, the chart position was irrelevant. It's what it did to the album, because the album was doing okay. Funny thing is that we, we were touring America from August 87 till about April 88, and the album did okay. And then we left to come to Europe, and then the album went up. <laughs> I'm like, is it, is it something I said? <laughs> and we came back uh, after like the European tour, because the album, again, was the first big album in Europe for us. In England, it was huge. We, did, we were doing the NEC in Wembley and, you know, all these great gigs in Europe. And we, we outsold, we broke Habba's attendance record in, in Oslo. You know, I mean, it was amazing. And we come back to the States and, like, when we left the States, the album had sold three and a half million. And when we came back, it was at five. We were only gone for about eight weeks. And then it just kept going. And by the time the tour finished, it was at ten. I mean, it was... Yeah, I mean, it doesn't make any sense these days because other than Adele or Taylor Swift, nobody sells like that. But there was a bunch of people. So, I mean, GNR did it, Van Halen did it, Michael Jackson did it. It was commonplace in the 80s, but it's, it's gone now. You're in a very elite few as well. I mean, people talk about gold albums, silver albums, platinum. You're in the very elite category that the album went diamond, which a lot of people probably haven't even heard of. Neither had we. <laughs> There was an award ceremony in um, New York. The, the, in fact, I think it's the only time they've ever done it because it was a one-off, you know. All the people that sold 10 million records ever were all invited to this do in New York. So there was CZ Top for Eliminator, um, uh, Us, GNR, Journey for, I think, maybe Escape, U2. I mean, you, just some brilliant records. Hotel California. Rumours, Sergeant Pepper, you know, there was no Rolling Stones. We couldn't get our head around that. The Rolling Stones have never had an album sell five million, apparently, never mind ten. And we're like, ha <laughs> 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 Little old notes of yeah. Sheffield, you know. <laughs> it's like, really? Of course, the Rolling Stones sell out millions of stadiums and we don't, so, <laughs> you know, they, they win. But um, <clears throat> it was an amazing thing, you know, and, and you get this long kind of crystal pole with a fake diamond on the top which is beautiful until Rory Collin breaks Phil's <laughs> smashes it to a million pieces and he's like 
damn. So he's already got the bass now, which is not as impressive as mine, I must say. It's like when you're playing at Wembley and you drop part of the FA Cup, the bass, and you just go, ah, or, or you're the one that gets the lid. Or you pick up the um, Stanley Cup upside down like I did and get death threats. Which is <laughs> and then you have to remind everybody that hockey is a game played by girls in the UK. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, was, that was my only defense for doing that. They never let me see the award before we saw it. It's like it's upside down. And then I find out, one, it was made in Sheffield, and two, it was that way up for the first 16 years. So I was just paying homage to tradition. Uh... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together so far for Joe Elliott telling us the story of the making of Hysteria here tonight at the Gibson Guitar Studios. Obviously, there's lots more that will come out over the years on the 60th anniversary, maybe, you never know, it'll all come out. But what we have for you now, Joe, is a million and one questions. We've had a competition running at planetrock.com for listeners to join us tonight. Quite a few are here yet. Uh, invited guests only, and also quite a few questions from your fan club. I can't see a thing. I know, it's oh, like, uh, yeah. There's the people headlights. out there. Yeah, there is. So we're going to ask the questions on your behalf, so thanks for submitting them, and I hope, Joe, that uh, they are um, not too, um, shall we say, personal. <laughs> I don't care. I know you don't. Ask whatever you want. So, let's fire in Neville Turner with the first question. He says, the end result hysteria was spectacular, but if you'd known at the very beginning, just how torturous this theory would be to actually record, would you have done a runner? No, I would still be doing it now. If I knew, you know, if I had that kind of godlike quality to know I was going to sound like when it's finished, it wouldn't have bothered me if it took 20 years to make. Um, we could have bailed at any time and just done another high and dry or another pyromania and been like, with the greatest respect to any rock band out there, another record that sounded like the one they did before. Um, we may have done it since and been guilty of that ourselves, but by then, it's album four, and we're judging ourselves against people like Queen. They've done Queen 1 and Queen 2, which were kind of similar, and then they've done Sheer Art Attack, which is out there, and then they did Night of the Opera, which is like, wow, where have you come from with this? You know, First single, Bohemian Rhapsody, are you kidding me? You know, We wanted to do that kind of leap of faith, if you like, so no, would never have bailed, absolutely not. Okay, Rebecca Schumann says, why do you think Hysteria was such a pioneering album? <sighs> um, well, when, you, when you're making these records, you don't realise what, what life and legs they're going to have. We've never made an album ever before or since, well, maybe on through the night. <laughs> We've never made an album before or since where we haven't put the same amount of effort in. It's just that, does it catch the public's imagination the same way? Of course, it, you know, some albums don't. Pink Floyd. Most people, if you say, name an album, if you've gone to the head, they'll just go Dark Side of the Moon. There's way more to Pink Floyd than Dark Side of the Moon. But that's the one they would say. You say Fleetwood Mac, they'll go Rumours. You say Hotel uh, uh, Eagles, you say Hotel California. Guns N' Roses, they'll go Appetite for Destruction. You know, U2, uh, Joshua Tree, boom. That's the way it is. There's, there's one record that defines, in a lot of people's eyes, you know, their career, you know. Why? I don't know. Maybe because we learned a long time ago that it's more perspiration than inspiration. You can have... The inspiration is easy. You just wake up one day and you go, I've got this idea. And it's how it's taken by the other guys in the band to be brought to fruition and then how it's taken by the audience once it's delivered to them and say, do you like what we've done? Um, that part of it is out of our control. Um, I think that we just managed to put 12 songs together that some of caught the imagination of a lot of people at a certain age, and they've hung on to it, and they, they've embraced it. A couple of questions now from people watching on Facebook Live. Thanks for uh, tuning in tonight. L Hodgetts 46 says, looking back on the recording of Hysteria, is there any song that you would have done differently now looking back on it? Hmm. Um, there are parts of songs that I listen to and I go, oof, <laughs> I think we could have done that better. You know, the, or just the way that they sound, you go, when we do this live, it sounds better than the record. Because when you do something maybe 7,000 times, you find different little ways of going, ah, oh, I wish it sounded like this on the record. Because when you do it on the record, you do it a certain way, and then whoever's in the room, which is basically, if it's, say if it's a vocal, it's me and Mutt. If the two of us go, when we're in a good mood, we've got out of bed the right side, you go, yeah, that's great. And then it is, and it's great, and it's great forever until you do it a different way, you go, that's actually better. 
but you can't, you'd never finish a record if you thought like that. So, yeah, there's, there's little bits of it where I go, hmm, we could have done that better. We could have done that differently. But you can't, you know, once you let it go, you, it's like opening a birdcage. You've just got to let it go. And it is what it is. So you embrace all the kind of imperfections as part of the real thing, you know. Sometimes it not being fantastic is great. I love some people that can't sing. I mean, I really do, you know, or, or they can't sing in the sense of like David Coverdale, Paul Rogers, you hear people like Gary Alton from the Heavy Metal Kids or Ian Hunter, or Bob Dylan, they're not really singers, but they can write great songs and they portray the lyric. Mm -hmm. And that's way more important than being perfection. I've never, I don't, I don't even know what perfection is. It's not my thing. Enthusiasm is way more important. And we caught the enthusiasm with that record. Absolutely. Josh Cherry, who's also watching on Facebook Live at the moment, says, for recent tours, what is Def Leppard's process in choosing the songs and order uh, for your tour set list? Well, in recent tours, it would be, if we've got some new music out, <laughs> playing some new stuff. Because like, yeah, new song. And they're all going, I don't know this. Just play Sugar and get on with it. Like, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Elton John, Elton John, brilliant. Elton John does a TV show or a radio broadcast for BBC. And he says the immortal phrase, now here's, a, here's the one thing you don't want me to say tonight. Here's a song from my new album. <laughs> 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 it's a constant battle, you know. Um, the last, say, 18 months, we've been focusing on promoting Def Leppard, the album that came out uh, at the end of 2015. So we've been playing what we consider three important songs off there, which is Let's Go, dangerous and man enough. And we'd love to play more, but we don't have time because there are so much more, so many more songs in our back catalogue that we, we owe it to ourselves and our own to play, and we're not stupid. I know people in bands who go, oh, I've got this one hit, but I'm not playing it. And we're looking, well, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's the only song anybody knows. Why would you not play it? I'm bored. Well, you can't, th then don't write it. You know, it's like, that's the one song we all want to hear. You know, I saw the Trogs once in Twickenham. They played a 40-minute set. They opened with Wild Thing, they ended with it, and they encored with it. <laughs> <laughs> They're only on stage for 40 minutes. You know? Got to be done. Got to be done. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we get the responsibility of the song. So when people come to see us live, they aren't coming to be educated. They, they, ed they get educated listening to the record. You come to the live, especially if a legacy band you come to enjoy the experience i go and see mccartney and i want eleanor rigby and live and let die and ban on the run and eight days a week and let it be that's what i want i've heard them a million times or so i want to experience them his mouth to my ears in the same room live the same with the rolling stones the same with any band that's been around it doesn't matter it's iron maiden or u2 or duran duran it doesn't matter who it is i want to hear what i know and i will indulge you a new song every 20 minutes i don't have a problem with that and i have to think that's how our audience think too so if we open with a new song the ones that don't care are still in the toilets <laughs> the ones that care are in the seats and they will listen you know and then so the ones in the toilets come out and the air animal go oh they opened it with animal <laughs> and you want to see it live as well, not through a mobile phone, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> now, another question from one of our prize winners, Stephen Lawrence says, uh, will we ever see a Def Leppard album produced again by Mutt Lang? It's a great question, and I'm about to disappoint a lot of people. <laughs> and the only, the only reason I'm going to say no is because Mutt is... It's 26 years since we worked with him. So imagine how old he is now. <laughs> <laughs> and what he does with his time is up to Mutt. Phil speaks to Mutt on an on a almost daily basis. Well, probably every, you know, tw twice a week. He used to phone me every time Sheffield United lost and Ipswich won. He would just leave a message going, it wasn't nah, very nah, often. Nah, nah. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, fair we lost a lot, but they didn't win a lot either. Um, we worked with more on, people seem to forget this, we worked with more on, on um, Euphoria. We did three songs with him on Euphoria. We did Promises, All Night, and It's Only Love. And it's not like they set the world on fire, you know. Um, we kind of, thank you, <laughs> we kind of ran our course with him, you know. It's like even he said, look, you don't, 
you've got a career now. You need to learn to lose. You need to learn to win in your own, on your own rules, on your own terms. And we're very comfortable in our own skin failing. If we have to fail, we'll fail. I think with the last album, we didn't fail. I think it's a great record. In another generation, another era, it would have been as big as Pyromania, because you know, there's some great songs on it, you know? When, when we did Slang, it, it was seriously, we seriously considered calling it commercial suicide. <laughs> because we were desperately not trying to follow the trilogy we'd done. We had to do something different. It was nothing to do with grunge. We just needed to do something different and prove to the, ourselves, we didn't really care about anybody else, but, and that sounds arrogant, but that's how you have to be when you're an artist. You know, you, you write these songs for yourself and hope other people like them. We were going through, for the first time in our lives on slang, death, divorce, marriage, children, whatever, and it leaked in. So positivity and negative, what if we'd always written like, yeah, yeah, you know, rock all night, bullshit, or whatever. We started going, there's another side to life than just rock till you drop or whatever, you know. We started bringing in the things like All I Want Is Everything, which was like, you know, the perfect crowd, like you can't have everything, you can't have it all, you know. And, and songs like um, Pearl of Euphoria, which was a, a brilliant bit of work, really, and very dark lyric, and people weren't expecting it from us, so they didn't accept it. They wanted another adrenalized. I was like, look, we're gonna go back to ground zero and we're gonna work our way back up because that makes us feel comfortable. By the time we got to Euphoria in 99, it was eight years since the previous up record and we felt comfortable going back there with things like back in your face and, 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 and promises and all that kind of stuff because it, it felt good. The 90s were gone and they were a miserable time for bands like us. Um, we did our best to, to we, basically we flew into turbulence and we, we knew if we kept it on flying, we're going to come out the other side and there'll be a life after, after that. And it, it started getting better and better and better. And because we never split up, we always had a, a goal that one day we'll get this back. And, and since the last album, it's really started to grip. People are starting to take more notice of the band, accept us for what we are and realize that there's some great songs on that last record that are up there with anything we've ever done. Absolutely. Amanda Sanderson says, who came up with the uh, idea of a round stage and what were the initial thoughts of the band when that idea first came about? I missed the first about? bit of the question. What was it? Amanda says, who came up with the idea originally of the round stage when you toured in the round and what were the initial thoughts of the band when that idea first came about? Peter Mensch, our then manager, suggested it. Um, why, I have no idea. But he just said, hey, we're going to, you know, what about playing in the round? And of course he said, well, it gives you four front rows. Yeah, but I'm not multi-talented enough to have four faces, you know. <laughs> Basically, every time somebody sees my face, somebody sees my ass, you know what I mean? Um, so we realized there was a lot of work to do, be done on a physical, but it's literally like running a marathon, you know, and trying to play and sing at the same time. Jesus, it was, it was hard. But Sonata had done it in a fashion, Yes had done it in a fashion, but they kind of just stood there playing while the stage rotated. And I think Aerosmith may have done it for a little while, but nobody did it the way we did. Like a boxing ring in the middle, you know, lasers and all this kind of stuff. So it was Peter's idea, and we embraced it straight away. I mean, once they'd built the little model, it was like Blue Peter. <laughs> it was like sticky back plastic version of the stage, you know. We're like, okay, so there's four little holes down this each side where we can all disappear and towel off, and then Rick's in the middle. How does he get the trap door? How do we get out there? Laundry baskets. Um, which, you know, led to lots of fun because now Adele's doing it. I mean, loads of people are doing this. And when we played Chicago, um, Robert Plant came to visit and he's like, so uh, how'd you get out on stage? Laundry baskets. Hmm. 10 bucks if you push one out. All right. It's always good for a bet, Robert, especially if it's United against Wolves, but for this is like, so he, puts on the bandana in a pirate patch and shoves a cushion up his shirt so he looks like a big roadie. And he shoves the laundry basket out for $10. <laughs> he didn't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it wasn't true that you're a tight Yorkshireman. I didn't know what I was going to say. Short arms, long pockets. Nothing. 
Jason Kersley now with the next question. Uh, when you finished the album, how really did you think it was going to sell? Obviously, you hoped it was going to do well, but what were your initial reactions after all that hard work and all the trials and tribulations? Well, when you, the, the term finish an album is kind of doesn't apply to Hysteria because when we walked away from the recording sessions, the, only Mutt Lang could have tidied it up because he's the only one that had the vision to pull in all the, yeah, it's fine, you know, I'm going to edit this all together. It was just a jigsaw puzzle thrown into a bag. He had to put it all together. We went off to rehearse to learn how to play these songs. I mean, you've got to remember things like Hysteria. There's 11 guitar parts on Hysteria. It's orchestrated literally like an orchestra. So Phil and Steve were like going, what the hell are we going to do? Which bits do we pick? You know, so we had a lot of stuff to learn to go. So we left Mutt to mix it. So as we left the recording sessions, we weren't really sure. We knew the songs were good, but we didn't know... We knew they'd sound okay because it's Mark Lang. Christ, you know, he doesn't make mistakes. But we didn't know how good it was going to be until the first few mixes started coming in. And we heard women and we went, oh yeah, that's good. And then we heard God's Award. It was like, Christ, this is cashmere. This is our cashmere. It's amazing. It just sounded fantastic. And then Animal. And then it all started coming in every couple of days, another mix. It's like, this is stupendous. We were listening to it like it was another band. We were listening like we were fans of somebody else. It's like it's a new Queen album. This is really good. I'd buy this. And so it was like we were detached from it until it all came together. And it's like, we made this record. It was a team effort. None of us saw it all the way through, but we did as a team. Everybody had their part to play. And then it all came together at the end. And Monk glued it all together. And, you know, and so by the time we heard it, I think Sav's the only one who was arrogant enough to say, I knew it was going to sell millions. Because <laughs> that's the way he doesn't say much, but when he does, he means it. And he's never, yeah, yeah. he's very rarely wrong. And he said, I just knew. And I'm, you know, we all looked at each other and went, Phil said it millions of times. He goes, you know what? If only one person buys it, and that's my mom, I don't care. Because this is art. I'm going to hang it on my wall because it's a brilliant piece of work. But luckily, you know, 20 something million people agreed with us. So. Brilliant. Another couple of questions from the fan club now on Facebook Live. Chris Preston. Hi, Chris. Uh, he says, Hysteria, such a masterpiece, favourite album of all time. Still one of the only records I'll put on and listen from start to finish in track order. Seven singles, let's not forget, released from the album. But if there were to be an eighth single, which track would you have gone with? Easy. Because we actually said, oh, no, please, not another one. Which is, I mean, how ridiculous is that now? It's like you're thinking back, like, did we really say that? Oh, yeah, Love and Affection. That would have been single, that would have been the eighth single. I mean, I don't consider women a single because they, they went to rock radio and it just died a death. They had a number 80, nobody played it. This is crap. You know, because it was like the lead-off single from a band that hadn't been around for four and a half years. It's like, what he said, it, it wasn't the boom that Animal was in the UK. In America, it was like, hmm. And then we, so they, it becomes the second single in America. So it doesn't have the same impact because it's kind of already out on an album. It's in the top 10. Um, but, you know, these singles were coming out and they were doing okay. They were doing really well. They were all going to number one. A couple went, we went, we had one number one, a couple of twos, a couple of threes, and mostly top 10 and top 20 or whatever. But um, we were going to go with Love and Affection, but we were already off the road in the studio trying to come up with what was going to be the next album and we're like oh, really so we just said just shut it down let's move on you know and move on you did alan connolly who's also watching on facebook live at the moment says joe what is the chance of a hysteria 30 tour next year in the round in your face full stage in the middle opening of stage fright curtain falling down Would be a popular choice, I feel. Watch this space. Yeah. Enough said. Uh, moving on, Andy Hankin, who says, forgetting tragedies, what is your fondest memory of the recording process? Watching Rick recover, um, watching him, his confidence come back, watching him as a human being grow into the man he is now. Um, was a big part of it. Um, 
it was Phil's first album writing with us. So that was an interesting change and a very important one because I'd been a huge fan of him since the girl days. And I, I wanted him in in 1980 because we were having big problems with Pete. And you know, he st when Girl were opening for UFO, they stayed at my mom and dad's house. And um, <laughs> my mom gets up the next day and she's just, there's mascara on the pillowcase. <laughs> yeah, mom, it's stage makeup. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> And him and Phil Lewis stayed at my, you know, stayed with me, and and we 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 were mates, you know. I, he would stay with me when they were up up north, and I would stay at his place in Walthamstow when we were down south. Um, and I, he, he finally came into the band on. It was World Cup final day, 1982, when Pete went and and Phil came in, and there was a big part of the whole way that the album went. So writing with Phil was was exciting because he was new, and he was writing the kind of music that we wanted to be involved in, which was a bit more. It was a less, less the kind of bluesy metal stuff that Pete was bringing in, and it was more the glammy stuff like, well, not even glam, but like Tie Your Mother Down or Now I'm Here. It was class. It was classy stuff. Um, but if there's an overall, if there's an overall kind of memory of the album, it was playing two years of table football with Nigel Green <laughs> and losing 99 games to 100. On the final game, it was, you bastard. You know? <laughs> You're supposed to lose on purpose. I'm the bloody singer, for God's sake. <laughs> and then didn't happen. We, had, we, we did have a lot of fun. You know, it's all, everybody documents negativity because it's, it's, it's great to watch. Documentaries on detectives that don't solve cases. You don't yeah. cheer when you rescue the kitten from the tree. It's, not, it's, it's the end story in the news. There's a lot of negativity around hysteria. But there was a lot of fun. You know, when we were recording, so when we were doing like Rocket, I went to Amsterdam, which was about 40 minutes away from the studio, just, just to go and hang out and just do things because they were doing guitars. And I came back three hours later and they went, oh, wait, look at this. And we chopped this whole middle section into it that didn't, wasn't there when I left at 10 a.m. I came back at 1.30 in the afternoon or whatever, and I hear that whole middle section, which was like a 21st century version of the middle section, a whole lot of love, which was basically Bonham's hi hat going like this, and Robert going, making orgasm sounds. We'd cut this whole thing together, and it was all these slowed down vocals because there was all this technology in the studio. It was the excitement of seeing all these toys, and I've seen documentaries since on Sergeant Pepper and, and stuff like that, where you hear either Paul or John going, oh, "Joe, what does that button do?" and <laughs> I'm not see what happens. You push it, now the studio explodes, or something goes weird, and it sounds like seagulls, you know. And we were doing that a lot on that record. And when we got it right, we knew it's like we've just killed it. This is mind blowing, and nobody else would dare do this. Nobody in rock. The, like Frankie goes to Hollywood were doing it. Pet Shop Boys were doing it. Human League were doing it. But nobody in rock was doing it. And we were taking all that bravado that was happening in pop music and adding it to rock which nobody else would do. Most rock bands just want to go in, mic up and play, like it's a, a recording of them playing live. That's, that's a cop out to us, it's easy. It's great if it works, and we did, in fairness, we did it on a couple of the stuff on the new record, because it was, it's 2015 when we did that. But in 1986, 1985, we were pushing the envelope because it was there to be pushed. It's all kind of settled out a bit now, it's like medicine. We're waiting for the big breakthroughs. We've we've got the cure for for certain things. It's amazing We're waiting how it's for moved the big one. in five years because I mean Judas Priest, the classic story, of British Steel, um, the actual march on Metal Gods was the cutlery tray from the kitchen. That was the sound effect. I mean those sound effects didn't exist then. No, but that, you see that's what we call found sound, and that's that's cool because it doesn't exist. You can easily just go to some library and go. Cutlery sounds or whatever. <laughs> and it'll probably be that sampled. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so I don't want Judas Priest. I want to make my own up. So, you know, banging garage doors. Um, there's a, the beginning of um, a song on um, Retroactive called Fractured Love, which was actually the first song we wrote for Hysteria, but it got elbowed. There's, there's this kind of marching drum thing. And it's me banging my hands on a flight case, overdubbed a thousand times to the point where I had to cut my wedding ring off. <laughs> <laughs> First marriage, not second, not current marriage. 
because my fingers swelled up so, so badly that I was about to burst, you know. And, and again, because it, it's a unique sound. So that, the, the, that is fine. What, what we were doing with technology was taking things and turning them upside down. Like there's, a, there's the beginning bit of Rocket, there's this nonsense noise. And it's actually, the, we're fighting for the gods of war, just turned backwards and flanged. That's all it is. That's a great word, isn't it? You know, flanged. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> word, yeah. But the Beatles were doing this 10 years before us, but they had to do it physically. We just had a button that went, flange, <laughs> turn it inside out, turn it upside down, make it Russian. <laughs> we could do a million things, you know. Now it gets easier again. It gets way easier. Got a couple more questions before we wrap up tonight. And uh, Tina Allen, also on Facebook Live, wants to know, does Def Leppard have songs written or unrecording music in a vault somewhere, like uh, some artists do, and then after you've passed, there's all this stuff that comes out? Yes. Um, but they're not finished. You know, we, what we've got is like demos of songs that we never followed through with. And it didn't mean that they were bad songs, but we just kind of ran out of time. In fact, some of the songs that we've written in the past, they didn't work when we did them, but they worked 10 years later. And the, you know, we and the only reason that we revisited them is because we'd read stories about how um, the Rolling Stones, when they did "Tattoo You," it's mostly songs pulled from five, seven years ago, and they just brought them back in and went, "Why didn't we finish this?" And then they start me up. You know, the riff for "Start Me Up" wasn't written in 1981; it was like written in 1975, and they pulled it back and they worked on it. So a lot of "Tattoo You," which is one of my favourite Stones records is old material revamped, and Chris Kimsey just went, why the hell didn't you finish this? So we've got a bunch of songs like that. Bad Actress from uh, Sparkle Lounge, which came out in 2008, I wrote the backing track for in 1994. But we were like, we didn't want to sound like ACDC in 1984, <laughs> 1994, but we did in 2008. It's like, I don't care if it sounds like ACDC, that's fine. I didn't have any lyrics for it, so it wasn't even a song, it was just a riff, and it became a song, and it's like, who cares? Nobody else has ever heard it. So it's new exactly. to everybody except me. Even Phil had forgotten how it went. And so, this is so familiar. Went, yeah, you know, because you've had the demo for 14 <laughs> years on your iPads. You know? <laughs> We've got loads of things like that. And we revisit these things all the time and we steal bits from them. But we, you know, songs are new until the public hear them. It doesn't matter if they're 100 years old, if they've never been published or recorded. It, but sometimes songs, they're out of fashion and then they're back in fashion. Nowadays, there's no such thing as fashion because the 80s drum sound is gone. And so if you were writing songs that sounded like the 70s and the 80s, they were out of time. But now they're in time. You know, they sound normal. So you can revisit a song you wrote in 19, 1975 and it would sound okay now. Especially bands like the Choir Boys that sound like you know, they just sound like an old band, you know, and then they write great songs, but nothing is, it's not meant to be groundbreaking. It's in tradition of the Stones or the Faces or Humble Pie, and that's what they do. And sometimes we pull songs out that we thought were, they, they weren't relevant at a certain time, and then we go, what were we thinking? And we pull it out, and there's a great song there, and we'll do it. So we've got hundreds of them. <laughs> Final question is from Sonia Tonks, and it kind of, uh, really wraps up what we've been talking about because we've been discussing the, the last 30 years and beyond really throughout the process of making the album, touring the album, everything else in between. And Sonia says, what would you put, if you had the chance to, in a time capsule from the band and why? Well, I'd have to put some kind of playlist together um, that doesn't technically... I wouldn't pick one album or one song. I would pick a playlist of songs that I thought were... If I was sending it off to Mars and... I wanted some alien that understood human techno technology and way of thinking. <laughs> this is going nowhere, is it? <laughs> <clears throat> so let's imagine there's a Martian that has any idea what we're talking about. So you're going, okay, people that have never heard us, what would I want them to hear? Or maybe a guy that like survived World War II living in a jungle or something like that. We send out a time capsule of songs. It would just be a playlist. And of course I would have to, pick the playlist right now. So it would be probably half this album, and it would be maybe a song or two off Pyromania, uh, a song or two off anything in between. It would be like a two-hour playlist 
of our career. And it, I would pick what I consider my highlights. And I don't know what that would be, but you know. Yeah. That, 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 yeah, well, I mean, you just named two songs that are very vastly different, but they're, they're, they're valid. You know, even Desert Song, which was, again, one of Steve's classic songs from the, it was written in Dublin about March, April 84. But by the time we got going on, on what was to be Hysteria, it just sounded a bit ploddy. You know, we were trying to, he was trying to write Kashmir, and it, you know, he just got elbowed for the, the more sexier stuff like, you know, Armageddon it and, and Sugar and Animal. And then we came, we came back to it in 93, and like, he didn't have any lyrics, so I wrote the lyrics. Actually, I remember where I was. I was in a hotel on a beach in Portugal. We were about to do a gig that night, in case case, and I just sat down, and it just came out. It was just lightning in a bottle. I don't take any credit for it. I just captured this thing. And there was the lyrics. It's like they read well when they were good at sing well, if they read well. Most of our lyrics don't read well. They sound good, but, you know, it ain't Bob Dylan. You know what I mean? <laughs> I suppose the rocks had a question. You know what I mean? <laughs> but with Desert Song, it's like, it was cool. It's like poetry, you know. Um, but it wouldn't have worked in 84, or 85, 86. It worked in 93. That's a great example of a song that was out of time. But it came into time in 93, you know. So I would just pick whatever my current playlist is, which, to be quite honest, I have no idea what it'd be. Finally, before we let you go, Joe, we've talked about the past. We have to talk about the future. Uh, you hinted before about uh, some maybe special shows next year. What does the immediate future hold? Because you've just done these massive shows in the States, again, going down an absolute storm every single night in the arenas right across the States. What about the future? What, what's planned? Is there a new album in the pipeline for the not-too-distant future? Um, there's, there isn't an album planned, but we, we are an ongoing situation. Def Leppard never comes to a conclusion, or hasn't done yet. You know, if we, even if we disappear for four and a half years, like we did between Pyromania and Hysteria, we were working under the radar. We're always working under the radar. I know for a fact that me and Phil have got a song on the go, Sav's got a song on the go, I've got another song on the go. <laughs> um, that's been discussed. Um, <laughs> We tried to do that about two, three years ago, and we ended up with an album. So, you know, um, seriously, we were trying to, we were just going to do three songs. We said, well, I've got this song, I've got this song, I've got this song, well, I've got this song. Oh, Twelve songs. Wow. Yeah. So we're waiting to see what, what happens there. Um, we've got, uh, in the not-too-distant future, we've got eight shows in South America, starting with Rock in Rio on the 22nd of September. And that goes through... Um, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, uh, Santiago as well in Chile, finish about the 7th or the 8th of October, and then we're done till next year. So what happens in between then and, and next year, uh, it, it's not a closely guarded secret, but um, I've got to deliver a, a Down and Outs album or I'm going to get taken to court. <laughs> 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 it's a contract. Um, I'm working with this girl called M. Griner. She's a fantastic singer-songwriter from Canada. And um, people have asked me what it's going to sound like. And when Robert Plant and Alison Krauss made that record, it's going to be kind of like Leonard Cohen and Tori Amos making Hunky Dory. So it's totally nothing to do with Def Leppard. I've got that to do, plus the fact that me and Phil were talking the other day. It's like, we've got to make some new music. So we're going to write and record and see what happens. And if it comes out next year, great. If it doesn't, it comes out the year after. It doesn't matter. But there are going to be shows next year. There's probably going to... There's probably going to be shows in the UK. And they may feature an uh, iconic album in total. Or they might not. We'll have to wait and see. Um, I'm old school. I like to keep secrets. I hate Twitter. I don't do Facebook. I'm old school. I give news to the website and let him deal with it, you know. But uh, we'll wait and see. But, you know, I'm not going to lead anybody up any garden paths other than maybe... Maybe we will do something very spectacular in the UK next year. Watch this space. Joe, as always, a pleasure catching up, mate. It's been a hell of a ride. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and say thank you to Mr. Joe Elliott. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you watching on Facebook Live as well. I hope you've enjoyed our insight into an iconic album, which comes out in all these various formats tomorrow. Enjoy, get all of them, keep them in your collection, and hopefully we'll see the guys on tour 
in the UK, as Joe just said, in the not-too-distant future. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and thanks for joining us.